It's one of those nights when it would have been easier to stay at home on the couch and wrap up in a blanket. But we, so we really do appreciate your, your coming to be uh, with us in our class. We have been studying the, the book of Daniel, and uh, we're into the second chapter tonight. Uh, we're going to be looking at the, uh, the, the vision or the, uh, of the statue that uh, the King Nebuchadnezzar had. But I just want to just review for a, a moment or two a couple of things that we, uh, we talked about last week in the, uh, in the lesson. Remember the, the thing I mentioned, the two questions that are prominent here in the second chapter of Daniel. One is, who is the ruler? Nebuchadnezzar obviously thinks that he is the ruler. And the second question is, who is the wise one? And Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's got a whole house full of, of wise people that he has trained. Remember, the first chapter was about him training wise people. Now he thinks he's got a whole house full of wise people. As we saw in the first chapter, the four people who were the wisest was the ones who devoted themselves to being a children of God. And then in this, uh, the second chapter, we've already seen uh, the ones who are the wisest are the ones who stopped and prayed to God and asked God to give them the answer. And so that was kind of our uh, our. Uh, what we looked at last week in the first part of the book of Daniel. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a problem. He couldn't understand his dream, so he went and got foolish counsel, which resulted in disaster. We're going to kill all these advisors. We stop, pray to God. God gives an answer. The wise counsel now comes back to Nebuchadnezzar with the answer to his dream, what is your dream all about? And the wise counsel comes back in the very last of the, uh, of the, uh, the chapter we see Nebuchadnezzar ends up understanding based on wise counsel. If that's not a sermon outline, I have never seen one. You know, how many times have we had a problem in life? I'm just gonna stop here and just talk a little bit. How many times we had a problem in life and we listen to our foolish selves on how to solve that problem. Rather than stopping and praying and going to God's word and look for the solutions that we should have in our lives. We end up with disaster on one hand and we end up with understanding on the other hand. And, and uh, I think that's just such a good advice for us. And that's prim primarily what we spent last uh, week looking at. Uh, Tonight, we want to primarily focus on this dream as, as, as we, that Nebuchadnezzar had. And I just want to look at a, a little bit of a uh, background about this, about Nebuchadnezzar and himself, himself and then the, we'll look into the dream. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. And as we saw in the, the, uh, the beginning of this chapter, it says it's in his second year. Actually, the way the Babylonians counted time, he's already completed full, two full years of his reign. And so we would say he's in his third year, but that's, that's just, he's completed two full years of reign. So he's, he's relatively early in his reign. Now, before Nebuchadnezzar uh, became the king, his father, Nabopolassar, had destroyed Nineveh. And remember, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar, as, the gen as a general for his father, had then destroyed the remnants of the Assyrian army, and he had <laughs> defeated Pharaoh Necho out of Egypt at Carchemish. And after he did that, he had gone down into Judah and some of the regions around and captured uh, people and took them hostage back to Babylon. So this, and that's what we saw in the first chapter was he started training some of these people. So now we have Nebuchadnezzar who is sitting as the king of the world. And in the, the first, uh, of this, or in this uh, chapter, in verse 29, which is actually the, 
the first event of the chapter is in verse 29. That's kind of strange, but uh, as Daniel is re, re, uh, recounting to Nebuchadnezzar what went on, Nebuchadnezzar's laying awake, worrying about the future. Have any of you ever done that? Sure we do. All of us have. Now, what do you suppose Nebuchadnezzar is worrying about? Here he's sitting on the top of the heap, and he's just seen the Assyrians who were on top of the heap. They've been annihilated. Do you think he's wondering what's going to happen to me and my kingdom? Where, where are we going to be in the future? I, suppose, I think that's probably what he was really worrying about because when we see the, this dream and the answer to this dream, that's the question it answers. And so Nebuchadnezzar is, uh, is, is sitting there and uh, uh, he's laying awake worrying about the future. Then he had dreams, it says in verse one, which I believe to be the same dream repeated because when it gets down to uh, the verse two, it says, I had a dream. So have you ever had a recurring dream? And when you have a recurring dream, you begin to wonder, is this thing significant? And the rest of you ever thought that, what's significant about it? Well, I, that seems to be where Nebuchadnezzar was with this recurring dream. He's worried about his future. Now he has this recurring dream. And what is going on here? He, uh, and that's when he then, of course, he sent this recurring dream caused him, he was troubled and he couldn't sleep. And then we had all of that sending to the foolish advisors and then the final Daniel comes, the wise advisor. And where we're picking up to, tonight uh, is uh, where Daniel is coming back with a wise uh, advice from God. And Daniel starts off with God has revealed. You've had this ring and uh, uh, and he's, he says, God has revealed what will take place in the future. That's what Nebuchadnezzar was worrying about. He was worrying about what was going to take place in the future. And in his dream, Daniel tells him, God has revealed what's going to take place in the, in the future. And then Daniel also says in the, the 30th verse, God gives the interpretation so that you can understand. So God is addressing the king directly. So I think when we, when we look for an understanding of the dream, the dream was a message first for Nebuchadnezzar. And so our, we have to understand, when we uh, try to understand this dream, we have to understand what did this mean to Nebuchadnezzar? And then we can draw some meaning for, our, uh, uh, for ourselves from the dream. And I think that's going to be an important thing to keep in, in mind as we as we look at this. I've got verse 31 here on the board, and I'm gonna just go mention a couple of things. Uh, when we have a vision or a, a dream or something, it's a message is delivered in an indirect method, is, is what I wanted to say. It's not saying this and this is going to happen. We get a picture or an idea of something, and then we had to figure out from the picture what the message is. Now, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't figure this, this dream or this picture out by himself, and that's why he's asked his wise men, and that's why Daniel is sent, uh, finally sent to him, so God will explain this picture to him. Now, I've got verse 31 of the second chapter. I've got it up here in four different translations, and I've done this for a purpose. We and the translators have a difficult time knowing exactly what the picture is, or they have preconceived ideas about what the picture is, and that influences the words they use in, the, uh, in their translation. Another thing that if we go back to the Aramaic, which this portion is written in, in Aramaic, or the Hebrew, the pronouns of a, a and the are not there. And so the translators into English had to put them there. And I want to just focus on a couple of things in this, this reading here. The first one is 
uh, in the English Standard Version. And he says, and you saw king and behold a great image, this image mighty and of exceeding brightness stood before you and its appearance was frightening. Um, a couple of things just notice that we have this great image. It's a mighty image. It's exceedingly bright and it is frightening. The uh, New American Standard Version says, you, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. So you get a little bit different idea from that. First, we have this frightening image. The second, we have this awesome statue. Uh, I, I just... Then the third one I have here is the New King James Version. You, O king, were watching, behold, a great, great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and his form was awesome. Then finally down here, I have the Young's literal translation. It's a, a translation that I, uh, I have access to, so I, I use it when I just kind of want to see what the, uh, how it was written in the original language. Thou, O king, wast looking, and lo, a certain great image, this image mighty and its brightness excellent. It is standing over against thee and its appearance is terrible. So I get from the literal translation there that Nebuchadnezzar is standing there in his dream and right here is this big old image. And he's intimidated by this big image that's in front of him, which I think all of us would be. We, he's, it's frightening, it's intimidating. Well, here's Nebuchadnezzar, he's the king of the world. And he's intimidated by this dream from God. I think from, to me, any message from God is intimidating. And I think that God is trying to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention here with, with, uh, with the vastness and the size of this statue. Next thing I wanna look at is he goes on then and uh, he describes this uh, image uh, or this uh, that he sees. And it, it is a single image it's in a single image, it's in the form of a man. I think that's going to be important for us if we try to understand this. It's not, you know, five different pieces. It's a single statue or single image in front of him. Uh, I think that's important. It has the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, the belly and thigh of bronze, legs of iron, and the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So it has has five regions distinct in the description there to this statue uh, uh, as, as he's, he's looking at that. Uh, now we're gonna go down to verse, verse 34. In this dream he has, he, uh, you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Two things I think are, we can surmise from this verse is one, the stone is cut out with hands. What does that indicate to you? Pardon? Man's not involved in it. it man didn't, didn't carve his stone out. He didn't blast it out. This indicates that this is something that's supernatural caused this stone to, to be here. I think that just can be uh, concluded from that. And it struck the statue on its feet as we're gonna get into this uh, interpret or, uh, interpretation Daniel gives. We see the feet as the most vulnerable part of this statue because the feet are two materials that just don't bond together. And so it strikes this statue uh, on its feet and so it's, it, it has a vulnerability or a weakness that's going to cause it to come down, uh, I think is the idea. Now, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time. I think that's significant. We have one statue and that one statue is destroyed in one action. The stone coming down and, and destroying uh, that statue. It became like chaff from the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away. 
so that no trace of them was found, but the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole world. The stone displaces the statue and becomes a prominent one. The statue was prominent in front of Nebuchadnezzar. God destroys this, or this supernatural power destroys it by destroying it from its, from its weakness. And then this supernatural power fills, fills the world with a kingdom. And so I, I think we can easily see, see that. I, I think that, uh, and so what I, I guess what I'm trying to emphasize here, it, whatever happens to this image, it is one image and it happens simultaneously. It all happens in one event or at one, one time. It's not like we think of as history. We're going to identify what we think the, uh, these parts of the image uh, represent as he comes down here and he, uh, he uh, interprets his statue. Uh, so another thing I think that is implied by this is that since God is in action or supernatural action here, this is a judgment against the statue, against the image. Uh, the, and so I think that's something we can kind of conclude from looking at this, uh, just from the, from the dream itself, I guess with our background and reading the interpretation, this is a judgment uh, against the, uh, the statue. A judgment and replacement. I think that's significant to think of those two things. Okay. The interpretation now, beginning in verse uh, 37, uh, he says, your king are, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of man dwell or the peace of the field or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Two or three things I, I want to notice here. You, O king, are the, and some translations said a king of kings. Depending on the perception of the translators of the different versions, some says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the king of kings. Some translator says, you are a king of kings. Now, whichever way we see that will have some effect on how we understand the message, if he, never you're the greatest king there ever was, or Nebuchadnezzar, you are a great king. Uh, now, I just, just, I'm gonna keep that in your mind. The thing that we're concerned about, he has caused you to rule over all these things. He has caused you to have rule. And what does Nebuchadnezzar have rule over? He has, he has, he has a kingdom with power and strength and glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, he rules there. Or the beasts of the field, he rules there. The birds of the sky, he rules there. They have all been given to the, into your hand. God has given you rule. I think that's the, the statement that he's making to Nebuchadnezzar here, the, the uh, uh, first of it. So what we're really looking at here is rule. Uh, when we think about Nebuchadnezzar, and well, uh, let me go ahead and go to this next next part of the slide here. I remember last week when we finished class, I said I, I showed this verse. Uh, I'm sorry, I showed this verse and asked you to look for similar verses elsewhere in the Bible. You don't have to go very many pages into the Bible to you'll, you'll find a verse that's very, very similar to this verse. And, and this is in Genesis uh, 1 and 26 and 27, when God is uh, uh, said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over. There's that rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cat earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. When God created man, he gave man rule over the earth and everything in it. And that was a, 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 something God gave. God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. 
male and female, he created them. So God created man in his image and gave man rule over the whole earth. And part of what God gave him, he gave him a charge to keep the garden. When God gives anyone rule, he holds them accountable for that rule. And we see that very, very definitely true with Adam and Eve, right? When Adam and Eve entered into sin and God comes back and says, Adam, where are you? He's asking Adam, uh, he's calling Adam into account for his rule. I think that's what he is saying here to Nebuchadnezzar. God has given you rule and you are accountable for how you rule. I think that's one of the things this image. So very, very from the very outset, I think Nebuchadnezzar is being examined for his rule or God is, God is, is uh, it's about accountability for his rule. Now, uh, we see this is true all through the New Testament in the examples that Jesus gives. Whenever someone is given an, uh, something to be responsible for or in charge of, just the, the parable of the talents, what's it about? Someone given the responsibility and being accountable for that responsibility. Uh, you know, the, the uh, parable of the vineyard. The owner goes to a far country and leaves someone in charge of the vineyard. They're accountable for that, how they handle that. So I think one of the, the first things I want to see in this, in this interpretation, Daniel begins with, you are accountable for your rule before God, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Any thoughts or, or comments here? That, that makes sense, or it seems to be where, where he's going with Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> um, go to verse 39. Uh, another, and then, so he's told Nebuchadnezzar that he's the, he's the, uh, he's the head of gold on this great image that is there. Uh, and I think you think about being the being head that also head uh, kind of suggest authority and you're the head of gold. So now therefore you're, you're responsible, you're accountable for what happens here. He says, then another king inferior to you shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And that, I think all these refers to back, it shatters all things. And so he says, Nebuchadnezzar, we're gonna start with you. There's going to be another one that's called silver. There's gonna be another one called bronze or brass. And finally, there's gonna be another one of stone. These are gonna be kingdoms. Now. We have a tendency in, in to when we look at this to consider this as four different entities or four different things and then four different actions. I want us to see that these are four parts of one image or one uh, image before God. So whatever happens to one part of this happens to the whole image because the image when it was destroyed it was simultaneously the whole image was destroyed. And so I have a tendency not to want to break this apart and, and spend a lot of time looking at characteristics or what happens to one part. But I think the message to Nebuchadnezzar relates to the image which stands for rule, man's rule of empires is really what I, I think the message stands for. Now we generally think as we looked at these four uh, kingdoms that it starts with Nebuchadnezzar because that would be the Babylonian empire and that's because of what he tells us. The next great empire, if we look at history after Babylonian was the Medo-Persian empire. And then the next great empire after the Medo-Persian was the Greek empire that Alexander the Great uh, formed. Then the next great empire after the uh, uh, Greek empire was the Roman empire. These seem to be what he has in mind 
when he talks about these four sections, but I don't think he wants to, I don't think he isolates them as being the point of the image. The point of the image is here is man's rule over the earth. And here it's going to be characteristic of that. So the, the image itself stands for a series of kings or, or a series of rule. It's viewed as one entity. And I think by extension, it is extended to all kingdoms of men. Even the kingdoms that are living are ruling today that they fit under the uh, umbrella of this image. Uh, that, uh, and so whatever he says about this image is, is applicable to all kingdoms uh, of the world is what I, I see in this. Any questions or thoughts here? We'll go a little further. Yes, Adam? Do you think there's any significance to the materials that these are made out of? I know you were saying these are all one entity and one action. I don't think that's correct. But do you think that there's any significance to the materials? Because to me, what it looks like when the statue is, they decrease in splendor, but they increase in strength mm -hmm. until you get to the great bottom, of course. And yet none of that matters in the final judgment of all of them. Maybe I'm, I'm sorry. I'm no, you, no, no, you're, you're, I appreciate that. Let's keep, make sure I get into that. I, I think Adam has a real good point for us here. These statues or these images, these, all these kingdoms that come after Nebuchadnezzar, they're going to have various characteristics, but they're all going to get rolled up or crushed. Now, he does specifically say to Nebuchadnezzar that the one that comes after you will be less than you are. It's, and that we kind of jump on well, there's there's silver or there's gold and silver is not as good as gold. So that, that just fits that. And the next one, bronze is not as good as silver. And then of course stone is the is the least of monumental materials. I think there is something maybe to that, but what I I see in that is if that indeed is a picture that the image is degrading as, as it goes, all of man's rule has a tendency to degrade, I think is one of the, uh, the pictures we see. Look at the kings of the Old Testament. We'd come in and uh, we'd have a king that'd come out and, and he'd really start off trying to do well. And by the end of his kingdom, he's proud and he has done one, he's wandered way off. So I, I, I do think uh, there's some of that. And, and I do think there's the idea that Adam has there is, is very apropos. Man can have any kind of kingdom he wants, but it is going to be less than what God would, would have. That, that, that's a really good thought. Appreciate that. Okay. Now I want to jump to the next piece, which are the feet and toes. Now, uh, I don't claim to have any lock on the understanding of this, this vision or this the dream. But as I read this, I've heard lots of uh, interpreters speak of it in four pieces. If you read it, he presents it in five pieces. The feet are presented as a separate characteristic of this statue than the, uh, the rest of the, the statue or the image. And also the image is destroyed at the feet at the, the base of it. And I've already suggested, I believe that the feet are, there's a weakness in the feet and, and he describes the weakness for us as far as a, a statue is concerned. And you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it, in it toughness of iron as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet are partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom was strong and part of it would be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. They will, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. So if you're going to crush this statue and you see it's got these two elements down here, and one of them's really strong like, like iron and the other one is just... Uh, uh, mud or clay, you know, we take a hammer and smash clay things all the time, right? Uh, 
I know that uh, Ernestine has a bunch of clay pots that she plants flowers in. And the guy that carries them undoubtedly breaks some of them every year. And he has to go buy some more. And so we, we understand how brittle clay is. So he says that's a flaw or a weakness in this. So there's something about this grand statue here, which represents the rule of mankind that has a major weakness in it that causes it not to be successful in what it is doing, I think is the idea. Uh, it's, going, it's going to end up and it's finally coming down. So men's empires are built on a weakness and it has to do with the combining and not adhering. Uh, is the uh, seems to be the, the point here. And I want us to look at Genesis 2, verses 1 to 6. It, well, a couple of things in this. He talks about this as uh, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another. This idea of the, the seed of men uh, is, I think, a, 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 turn back to Genesis here with me. Uh, that's six and one and two and this is uh, at the time that man is beginning to become corrupt it's after right, not long after creation it came about when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of, of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of whomever they chose if you go on and read in this, we'll see man began to corrupt his, his, himself and began to corrupt because he did not pay attention to the seed of man staying with the seed of God, and he began to intermix with the seed of man. So I, 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 th I kind of get the same idea here with the, uh, the kingdoms of the, of the world. How do the kingdoms of the world try to cement themselves to make themselves strong? Do they all turn to God and teach the gospel? All right. Solomon was great at this, wasn't he? It's a common practice was to go and to cement your strength by marrying either for your son or yourself taking a wife of another country. So you, you brought through human means, you tried to bring two nations together. The one who did the best job of this was uh, oh, Jehoshaphat and Jezebel. He went to Ahab, to Ahab and Jezebel and got their daughter at the lie to marry his son. Now, what did that do for the kingdom of Judah? It was going to get peace between Israel and Judah, but it almost destroyed Judah. So I think this is kind of the idea where, where it's be through marrying, but it, or what it is introducing man's methods into governing here rather than God's methods. Adam and Eve, their primary charge when God placed him to rule over the earth was to see that the, that the earth was filled with the glory of God. That's what their primary charge was. They allowed the earth to be filled with the glory of Satan because of their, their, their interaction with Satan. I think the same idea is being said here about God appointed that the kings be rulers. He gave Nebuchadnezzar rule of the whole earth, but men's governments, men's rule gets polluted, becomes weakened whenever they use men's devices to sustain their rule. And that is not going to build a cohesive kingdom. And you, you see all over the uh, all over the Bible, all over the world, this being being the problem. So that's what I see him saying here, uh, uh, as far as this, this seed of men and, and the weakness there. There is definitely a weakness, has to do with adhering, 
And I, I believe it's that man does not, or man's rulers do not build a kingdom based upon what God would have them do. Rather, they become uh, selfish. Yes, Eddie? As we look at the historical people, of course, the next part of the screen is going to say the days of those kings, which are right. those people called empire. Right. What we see in the first century is that the Jewish kingdom is intermingling with the Romans. I mean, you know, when they decided to crucify Jesus, they used the Romans to accomplish what they wanted to do. Okay. And if we see this, the Sadducees especially, but all of the, the Jewish leaders in one way or another were intermingling with the Romans. Okay. And, and I think that's kind of the fulfillment of what you're talking about. Okay, and that, that's another good example of it, uh, of, of man trying to accomplish his rule by intermingling with uh, ungodly groups. And, and so I think, it, uh, I think it very definitely is, that's an example of it, and, but I, I think it applies to all of these kings, all of these rulers uh, from Nebuchadnezzar on, uh, uh, that, that they do not adhere to what God gave them. They go out on their own or their own devices and try to develop uh, their empire or rule based on their devices. Now, get down to verse 44. It says, in the days, and this is a passage that, or verse eight, we've got to get here. In the days of these kings or those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put to an end all of those kingdoms but it will itself endure forever. Okay, we've got this statue that's got these flaw. It's got to do with the way that they govern or rule. And that's what God is going to bring them down for because they're accountable for the way they rule. Not only is God going to bring them down, he is going to replace rule with the rule he intended from the very beginning. You remember when we get to the New Testament, we have the uh, we we have this idea that there was the first Adam, then Jesus was the second Adam. Jesus replaced and accomplished what Adam was supposed to do. Not just for us as individuals, but Jesus in the church replaces and accomplishes what governments were supposed to do. I think is the idea is the picture we have here in this. The weaknesses in man's empire, it's, it's a lack of unity, and it's based on, because it's based on man and his wisdom and the strength of the Christ kingdom, it's based on unity. How many times does that concept appear in Jesus' teaching? He wants, there's unity, there's being one, and that's what holds his, his kingdom together. Man's empire is self-serving. Christ kingdom or empire is sacrificial. And I think to me, this, uh, this answer is kind of a, or addresses a thought I have on this. When we, we look at this stone coming out of the mountain and crushing the statue, we're thinking that, man, I'd like to see God crush some things today. And just with the conflict that's going on, how many of us have a thought that, you know, Herod was eaten, smitten and eaten of worms? We might like to see Putin smitten and eaten of worms. That's, that's our idea of God coming and just putting a hammer down. How did Jesus put the hammer down? If we think this stone, and we see the stone represents God's action, how did Jesus put the hammer down? He, he allowed himself to be killed. It's not that violent thing that we see in this picture of rolling over that, you know, the kids, we have their, and we have them rolling over this statue and crushing it. We think of a violent occasion. But Jesus died for us. And that's what builds unity in him. See, it's, 
Everything to do with Jesus and his kingdom is a paradox. It is not like the, we think of the kingdoms of the world. Nebuchadnezzar was king of the world because he went out and killed a bunch of people and violently took over. As a matter of fact, when we get to the uh, fifth chapter, Daniel's going to be talking to Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He says, your father, Nebuchadnezzar, he killed whomever he wanted, and he kept alive whomever he wanted. Violence put him in power. Jesus dying being the sacrifice put him. And so when we think about these two kingdoms, it's really, to me, it's hard for me to visualize the significance of this because I'm always thinking about retribution. In the rest of you think about retribution. But Jesus was about sacrifice and forgiveness for us. That's what unites us. It's not that he came out here and, and destroyed our leaders and took over us. The kingdoms of men is one of the things that I think to me helps me with it. Kingdoms of men are about controlling place or space. They all have boundaries or space, and that's what they're fighting over now. The boundaries of the Russian versus the Ukrainians. What's piece of land or space do they control? The kingdom of God is not about controlling space or land or place. It's about hearts. And hearts can't be measured with space. And so it's really hard for us to visualize that the reason that the kingdom of God can fill the earth and be everywhere in the face of war is that we know there are Christians in Ukraine. There are Christians in Russia. There are Christians in Moldova and in and all those other Eastern countries. They are all united across, across space, across borders. Yeah. Colossians 1 tells us that God has delivered us, Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's how he conquered all those other kingdoms, is he captured the and believed. Okay. And so this, that helps me a little bit with understanding. There are still imperial rulers out there, ruling for themselves. But now Jesus, when he came and established church, he showed us a way that we can be loyal to God. These government was supposed to reward the faithful and punish the evildoer. It hasn't done that. Jesus is now, since he has been raised from dead and established his kingdom, he gives us something that we hoped for and we longed for and God has promised us that now he has filled. And we don't, that cannot be taken away from us. It will never be taken away. The, the, the empires of man are going to come and go. They're going to go in cycles. They're going to eventually fall. Uh, but Jesus is going to rule forever. It's not going to fall. And so what I see in, in this image, and we, we run out of time here, I talk too much tonight, uh, is, is the fact that God is giving a replacement. He's going to punish and replace that system that was supposed to propagate good in this world. It did not. So he's going to replace that system. Its weaknesses, it would depend on itself. And he's going to repl he's replace that system with Jesus. Now, what's Nebuchadnezzar going to take out of that? Well, he'd better understand that he is accountable to God is what he needs to understand out of that. Uh, when we get to chapter three next week, we're going to see that he had a little hard time understanding that. We start off, I, I want us to just go ahead and do a, uh, well, here, I mentioned that, we're going, we'll have to quit. Daniel says here, and as much as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that means as you saw that God did this, then understand 
that that was no casual dream you had. That was no casual message. Uh, and it would crush the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true. Interpretation is trustworthy. Count on this, Nebuchadnezzar. You're accountable before God, and you will be judged for the way that you govern. And I think is the idea. And count on that because this is God's action. It's not just some dream that you've had that's not significant. God was talking to you, Nebuchadnezzar. So I think the first message in this is to Nebuchadnezzar, who is ruler over the world, particularly over the Israel, the people of Judah, God is going to hold you accountable for how you rule. And that message is important to the, the people of Judah too, because they are under Nebuchadnezzar. Now, it's also important, I think, for them to see that they're not going to be saved by a king of place. They're going to be saved by a king of the heart. And we, we need to see that. And that's hard, hard for us to appreciate and understand. Okay. I've uh, taken extra time tonight, and uh, I appreciate you listening to me. I do not claim that this is exactly what God intended for us to learn here. But I do present these things as for you to go think about and see that it, God is trying to get Nebuchadnezzar and us to see that it is Jesus. God's kingdom is, is the thing that is sure for our lives. And so appreciate that. We'll take up, uh, we'll look at Nebuchadnezzar's reaction. That's probably good we're going to stop here. We'll look at Nebuchadnezzar's reaction. And then we'll turn the page to chapter three and we'll see his actions, which don't fit his reaction uh, very well uh, at the end of chapter two. Let's, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Our dear holy God and Father, we come before you in prayer this evening. We are very grateful for your love and blessings you've given us. Help us to understand that you are indeed the God of gods. You're the Lord of lords and that all else is under you. Help us to be devoted to you, help us to serve you, and place all of our faith in you. These things we pray in Christ's name, amen.